This morning, we're going to be taking a look in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. We've kind of been bouncing around a little bit between Luke and John, mostly in Luke. Uh, and we are going to be staying in Luke today. Um, and we are looking at the uh, concept of look who's invited to dinner. Uh, now, before we get into it, uh, the, well, the overarch, too, that we're, uh, uh, we're going to be looking at is uh, are you invited? And that's sort of the, uh, the, the overarch here, the operational uh, question that we want to ask ourselves this morning because this is a transitional piece of the Bible. Jesus is really taking us through a, a transition here uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament and bringing up some concepts that uh, uh, I think might challenge you. Before we actually get into the message, though, uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention uh, Memorial Day. Um, Memorial Day, uh, which is why our uh, seats, our pews as, as such, uh, are a little bit light because there's a lot of folks who are off on holiday. But uh, uh, as I mentioned before, God is going to bless you especially for uh, uh, making it a point to be in His house. Um, but Memorial Day is to honor those who have died in military service. Um, they died so that this could be the land of the free. And uh, make no mistake about it, in the history of the world, there is no country that has been more blessed uh, and in a stronger position than the United States. And that is due in large measure to uh, uh, our military uh, and the, uh, the men and women who have given their lives so that we could be free. Let me open us with, uh, with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for... Um, for this weekend and what it represents to, uh, to America. Lord, we, uh, we want to lift up uh, in prayer uh, the families of those who have lost uh, family members uh, in military service. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would encourage their hearts, uh, that you would give them a strength of uh, pride in uh, uh, what their uh, loved ones have represented to the freedom that we so enjoy here in the United States. Uh, Lord, second only to the freedom that you give us as believers in your son Jesus. Um, we pray, Father, that uh, you would just bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, for you are our strength and our redeemer. And we pray these things in the name of your son, your only son, Jesus. Amen. Now, we have not always been the land of the free. Um, 150 years ago in the United States, nearly three million people were in slavery. And we had, uh, uh, went through a variety of things, the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, President Lincoln uh, uh, working very, very strenuously, and of course uh, we had the, uh, the, the great conflict of the uh, not-so-civil war uh, that worked to uh, ensure the freedom of slaves. Uh, and again, nearly 3 million uh, as of uh, 1860 in that census. Now, 3,000 years ago, 3,000 years even before that, we had a very similar situation. Uh, not quite 3 million, but probably over 2 million people were in slavery uh, in Egypt, the greatest empire of the world at that time. And that would be the Jews, the children of Israel, God's chosen people. Um, and God went to great lengths to, uh, to set them free uh, through a variety of miracles gone through uh, by the, uh, uh, the hands of Moses. Uh, he took them out into the wilderness. And um, uh, on the way to the promised land. Uh, and and I want to make sure that we all understand that the promised land is a physical place in this world. It is not just eternity, it's that too. That is the promised land, uh, the life hereafter. But the promised land also exists in this world. Not as many of us grasp, grasp hold of that as, uh, as should, but uh, it is here uh, in this world. Now, um, context for Luke chapter 14, uh, where um, Jesus is talking about a great banquet. Um, we've got... Uh, Well, it's not advancing here, Pat. We were hoping that it would, but it's not. 
and I'm showing I've got a good signal, but um, Pat's going to fiddle with that. Um, in Exodus chapter 20, and since I don't have it on the overhead, I will, uh, I'll just open to it. Um, God, through Moses, says these words. He says, I'm the Lord your God. What did I do? I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Well, that doesn't seem like too much to ask. I mean, they were slaves, and now they're free. Uh, on the highway, heading down to, uh, to the promised land, that's a good thing. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. And God follows that by saying, you shall not make for yourself an idol. Again, not a big deal. Those are pretty straightforward. I mean, look what he's done for them. They're no longer slaves. They're on their way to the promised land. Well, what happens? In Exodus chapter 32, not very far removed from Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 32, Moses goes up on the mountain to have a little conversation with God Almighty, and the people of Israel get a little bit tired waiting for him. And so they decide, hey, let's pool our resources. We're going to throw all of our, uh, our wedding rings, our gold necklaces into the fire, and Aaron's going to craft for us, Aaron the high priest is going to craft for us a golden calf that we can worship. Um, and they all uh, decide that they're going to worship this golden calf. This is right after God says, hey, I got you out of Egypt. I got you out of slavery. Have no other gods before me. Make no other idols. That's of the Ten Commandments, commandment number one, commandment number two. And right off the bat, right after the uh, Israelites got those Ten Commandments, they throw them out the door and they get themselves a golden calf to worship. Uh, you know, how does this work? Now, Jesus is at a dinner that is given by a Pharisee. Um, the Pharisees um, are viewed by most of us, for good reason, as the arch enemies of Jesus. Now, God decided way back when the Israelites rebelled against him in the desert. In fact, uh, he had words with, uh, uh, with Moses. He says, I am so angry, I'm going to just burn this entire nation to a cinder, and I'll start over with you, Moses, and I'll let your offspring, your descendants, become the new nation of Israel. And Moses uh, begged and prayed on Israel's defense, uh, and, and God relented and said, okay, I'll cut him a break, but they're not going to get into the promised land. They're not going to enter the promised land. Uh, I'm going to let them stay here in the wilderness wandering around for 40 years until they all die off and their children can go into the promised land. That's the price that they paid for putting idols up in front of God. Now, Israel bumped along okay in the promised land. They did all right. But over a period of years and some bad kings, finally they were dragged off as captives by King Nebuchadnezzar up into Babylon. And in Babylon, they were told, you've got to uh, obey our laws, follow our customs, learn our language, eat our food, drink our drinks, and worship our gods. That's what the Jews were obligated to do. Now, there was a group of Jews who decided, no, there's just one God, and we need to keep separate from this worldly culture. We want to be free from this worldly culture. And the word separate in that language, in that ancient culture, is where we get our modern-day word Pharisee from. Those were the original Pharisees. They started off well. They wanted to be separate from the worldly culture. They wanted to be free from the worldly culture. Um, but over the years, uh, the other Jews, their fellow Jews, started to look up to them, see them as role models, which was all well and good. There's nothing wrong about that in and of itself. But those Pharisees started to put themselves up as idols. They started to view themselves as people who needed to be worshipped. And by the time of Jesus in the first century, they really resented when this upstart itinerant preacher came on the scene and started to draw all this tension away from them. So it's interesting that uh, uh, one of these Pharisees is actually uh, the host to um, this banquet that Jesus is sitting at. Uh, so I'm going to start here in Luke chapter 14. 
Uh, in the first service, I started off in John chapter 14, and it didn't go quite as well. I love the Gospel of John, but uh, it wasn't the text that we were all supposed to be together on. So Luke chapter 14, um, starting with um, verse 12. Now Jesus also said to the one who had invited him, and again, the one who had invited him is a Pharisee, supposedly one of the bad guys. When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Why? In case they might invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, what is wrong with inviting friends, relatives, rich neighbors? Nothing. Unless you do it at the expense of the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Uh, interesting little note here. Jesus says, you will be repaid because they cannot repay you. And I want to stop just to, this is a little bit of a sidebar. Um, but the you he's talking to is the Pharisee, singular, the one Pharisee. And uh, it's sort of interesting. Uh, the Greek has got um, two different words for you, Y-O-U. One is a plural, and the other is singular. So when I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking to you plural this morning. But the word you that Jesus uses here in the Greek is singular. He's, even though he's got a, 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 a banquet room in this Pharisee's house full of people who are all listening in rapt attention, he's speaking specifically to the Pharisee. It's a singular you. And he says, you will be blessed, Mr. Pharisee, because they can't repay you. And you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. That's a promise from Jesus to who? A Pharisee. I believe based on that language, and again, this isn't the main point, but I was just fascinated by it when I stumbled across this. I believe based on that language that this Pharisee is actually a believer. He says, I think this Jesus guy is the Messiah. I think he is the anointed one. Now, it's possible that this Pharisee was um, uh, Nicodemus. It's possible he was Joseph of Arimathea. It's possible he may be a name that we've never heard recorded anywhere in the Bible. But I do suspect, and this is just John Werner's opinion, that he was a believer because Jesus is speaking to him specifically and giving him that promise that he would be repaid at the resurrection of the, uh, the righteous. Now, again, I want you to view Jesus' words here in the Gospel of Luke as a transition. Jesus is being a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between the Jews who were disenfranchised from their promised land to the current day Jews in the first century as well as to us here in the 21st century, he's a bridge and he's talking about um, this banquet that we're invited to. And this banquet is not just eternity again. It is here and it is now, as well as eternity. Um, the Pharisees put themselves up as idols. And Jesus condemned that because you worship nobody but God. It's the first commandment and the second is very much like it. Now, I have to tell you that it's a trap that anybody speaking in front of a public group in a setting of believers can fall victim to. It's one of the reasons why I don't speak very often, maybe a half dozen times uh, a year here up front, because like the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago, I have issues with pride. I got a big ego. Uh, I love attention, and I probably spend as much time in prayer about people not seeing me but seeing Jesus as I do in preparing for the actual message uh, that I deliver, deliver. I am terrified of the idea uh, that people are going to look at me like, uh, you know, I'm different uh, and, and that just shouldn't be. Um, we're all followers of God and I do not want to ever find myself in the camp of being a Pharisee. Uh, of being somebody who wants to be looked at uh, just for the sake of getting attention. 
Now, there's a weird concept in this. Um, again, we talked, there's nothing wrong with inviting friends or, or anything like that. But you will be blessed because they cannot repay you is just a bizarre statement. How does this work? Here in America, our wonderful country is driven in large part by a thing called capitalism. Now, what's capitalism? It's business owners investing in people and products. And why are they doing that? Because they expect a return on their investment. Uh, ROI, it's known as in the business community. Now, how can you be blessed when the people you invest in can't repay you? Those are the folks Jesus is telling us to invite to this banquet. And why would you do it in the first place? Is Jesus speaking a foreign language? He's telling us there's got to be a lot of different kinds of folks coming to this banquet. People that you're not necessarily familiar with, people that you're not necessarily comfortable with. And again, it begs the question, are you invited? Um, invest in proven wealthy people you know and trust or invest in poor strangers. Seems like a no-brainer to answer, but Jesus is challenging us to look at it from the opposite way. Are you invited? Let me go on to uh, verse 16. Uh, verse 15, actually. One of the dinner guests on hearing this said to him, Blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. This guy's a clown. Um, I mean, what he's saying is true, but he's just jumping up to get the attention of Jesus and he's trying to be a yes man. And Jesus kind of dismisses him by just ignoring what he says and launches into his, uh, uh, the, the, the parable that uh, we're about to look at in verse 16. Jesus said to the Pharisee, someone gave a great dinner and invited many. And at the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything's ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. And another said, I've just been married and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and said this to his master. Now, why don't they come to the owner's banquet? Why don't they come? They've had the invitations for some time and when the, uh, he told them it's, we're all ready, we're good to go. Well, the first one, it's pretty straightforward. The first one, He's made a real estate deal, and he's got to go check it out. It says they all alike begin to make excuses. So the first one's got his uh, real estate deal. The second one uh, has got some new oxen. He's got to take them out for a test drive. Uh, and the third one has just gotten married. Now, these three excuses are very intentional. They're not by accident. Jesus is giving the three reasons that you and I all use to avoid and escape any multitude of circumstances. The first is pastimes uh, or preoccupations or occupation, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, the second is possessions. And the third is people. Pastimes, possessions, people. Those are the three things that we all use as excuses to get out of something, including getting out of church-related activities, getting out of activities, and I don't really care about church-related activities, but I do care about any activities that would disrupt the priority of my relationship with Jesus. Several weeks ago, we had as our text, um, anyone who does not hate father and mother, brother and sister, cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is not saying you should hate mom and dad or your brother or your sister. But what he's saying is, is that anyone who doesn't have me as a priority over mom and dad, brother and sister, cannot be my disciple. To be the disciple of Jesus, you've got to have Jesus as your first priority. And that's the same thing that God was saying back in Exodus chapter 20. Have no other gods before me. Make no idols. That Pharisee is not your idol. Uh, he's not supposed to come before me. Pastimes, possessions, and people, they're not supposed to be before me. 
God gave this great banquet and the children of Israel were invited. The banquet isn't just eternity. The children of Israel missed out. They missed out at the first promised land and they missed out when they were taken out of the promised land because they fell away from God and started worshiping other idols and were dragged off into captivity in Babylon. Um, and even after that, when they were allowed to go back to the promised land, they were still ruled by Rome. Uh, it was not their promised land. It was Rome's and they were basically squatters on Roman turf. The banquet isn't just eternity. It is here. It is now. God's banquet represents your promised land. Jesus knows that you have got incredible potential locked up inside of you. And it is just wanting to burst out of you, to be set free. And it is hung up by so many different things. But most of those things are the excuses that we make in keeping us from getting closer to Jesus. It's Jesus who gives us the ability to release that potential and to have it see its, uh, itself realized. The sweet spot for your life is God's promised land. And it is specific to you. Again, ask yourself that question. Are you invited? Um, let me go on here to uh, uh, verse 21. Jesus is finishing up his, uh, his parable. He says again, he's speaking to the Pharisee who invited him to this banquet. So the slave returned and port reported this to his master. I've got to stop right here. The word slave is interesting because we were referring to slavery earlier when we first started talking. Um, and it's not the same word that we use for slave. In the Greek, it is the word doulos. That's the actual Greek word. And it doesn't mean slave in the classic sense that we have. It means bond servant. Now, what's a bond servant? A bond servant is somebody who voluntarily agrees to enter into the service of a master for life. You give me three meals a day, and a roof over my head and a bed to sleep in, and I will serve you uh, in exchange for, uh, uh, you know, the service. Uh, three hots and a cot. Three meals and a bed. We're good. Uh, that's a bond servant. And that's what this word is. It's somebody who has voluntarily entered into lifetime service for a master. Um, now, Jesus, in this parable, is that bond servant. Many of the translations read slave. He is that slave, that bond servant, that one who has voluntarily entered into this service on behalf of his Father in heaven, God. Uh, and that's, that's who he's talking about. So the slave returned, the bond servant returned, and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. We've already mentioned them once. And the bond servant, the slave, said, Sir, what you ordered has been done, and there's still room. And then the master said to the bond servant, to the slave, Go out into the roads and the lanes and urge people to come in so that my house may be filled. Do you get the picture here? God desires a relationship with every man, woman, and child in this world. It is called God's green earth because he made it and the people in it he wants to have a relationship with. He desires to participate with you in this relationship. Um, so, in the last, the last verse that we have in this passage, uh, Jesus says, For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. None who are invited will taste my dinner. Now, who are the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame? You know, these are the people that Jesus served throughout his earthly ministry. These are you, the people that Jesus wants to set free from whatever it is, whatever kind of bondage, whatever kind of slavery you are in, and we all fall victim to it. Uh, more at different points of our lives than others, but throughout our lives, we all fall victim to that. Um, not being as rightly related to God and to Jesus as we should be. Uh, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. These are us. Now, Jesus invites us for two reasons. Number one is to heal. Um, 
And, you know, in the healing part, we see back uh, just a few chapters back, uh, the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to Jesus' disciples. And they're saying, why do you eat and drink uh, with tax collectors and sinners? You kind of get a picture here of, uh, you know, Jesus down at the bar, uh, you know, the local pub, uh, just uh, mixing it up with uh, all kinds of local riffraff. Uh, and the Pharisees are offended by this. So why do you do that? Uh, and Jesus jumps in, even though their question was directed to his disciples, Jesus jumps in and answers. And he says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've come to call not the righteous, not you Pharisees, you're self-righteous, sanctimonious, uh, but sinners to repentance. See, these Pharisees, uh, all they could think about was how good they were. So heavenly bound, they were no earthly good, uh, is the saying. Um, that's that's where, where we are right now. Um, so Jesus called us to heal us. That's why we're invited to this banquet. But the second reason that he invited us to this banquet is to party. I mean, we want to have a cool time. This is just going to be a, a raucous, body, wonderful, uh, kickback banquet, a big party. We are going to just have a great time. And again, you have to ask yourself the question, are you invited? And the answer is, of course, you are invited. Uh, the question is, will you accept God's invitation? Now, that seems like a really easy question to answer, but perhaps not as easy as you might think on the surface. Uh, several weeks ago at Men's Morning Watch, uh, we used an illustration where we compared Jesus to a mountain. And Jesus is at the top of this mountain, and there's two types of believers involved here. There are believers, uh, and then there is also disciples. Now, let's just clarify. All disciples are believers, but not all believers are disciples. A disciple involves a second decision. Now, believing is easy. In fact, it baffles me how more people don't believe. Uh, to believe, uh, you get eternal life. And John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, who wouldn't do that? I mean, that is the cheapest insurance policy in the world. It is a no-brainer. You would think that the whole world would go, yeah, what have I got to lose? Sure, I'll do that. Jesus is the Son of God. Sweet, I'm there. And they don't have to do anything else. Now, notice the believer is flatline. He's not getting any closer to Jesus, but at the end of this world, he does get in to heaven. He has eternal life. He will have a relationship with Jesus at the end of this life. May not have much of a relationship during this life, even though he's a believer, because he hasn't decided to actively follow Jesus. And that's where being a disciple comes in. Those people who make a decision to become a disciple decide, I'm going to follow a, a path that's going to take me um, up towards Jesus. It's a rocky path. It's a steep path. It involves obedience. Oh, man, I knew there was a catch. I got to obey. Ooh, that's the hardest thing. It involves sacrifice. It involves hard work. But you know what? And we also looked at this uh, when we, we talk about uh, I am the vine and you are the branches. It involves, at the end of it all, peace. Because the vine that's attached or the branches that are attached to the vine are abiding in Jesus. And they produce fruit just by abiding. Not by grunting and groaning. They don't. They just exist. They're just abiding, tied into the branch. It's a relationship with Jesus. But it's a relationship that comes from doing those other steps along the way before you get into that zone and everything just flows from that relationship with Jesus. It's called the mountaintop experience. And many of you have had that spiritual mountaintop experience from time to time. And you savor it. You want to bring it back. You want more and more of that. We want that mountaintop experience. Um, it's a distinction between a believer who is just flatlining their way to eternal life, and a disciple who has taken a climb 
and getting there and wanting to become closer and closer to Jesus and having a, a relationship with Jesus. So the master said to his bond servant, go out to the highways and country roads and urge people to come in so that my house will be full. Um, a number of years ago, I heard a recording of a, uh, uh, a preacher uh, reading something, and he said it was anonymous. So coming from me, it's also anonymous. I don't know who wrote this, but uh, I just was fascinated by it, and I think it really applies to what we're talking about here. Uh, and I'm going to just read through this uh, in closing. At first, I saw God as my observer, my judge, keeping track of the things I did wrong so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I die. He was out there sort of like the president. I recognized his picture when I saw it, but I, I mean, I don't really know him. But later on, when I met Jesus, it seemed as though life was rather like a bike ride. But it was a tandem bike. And I noticed that Jesus was in the back helping me pedal. Now, I don't know just when it was that he suggested we change places, but life has not been the same since. When I had control, I knew the way. It was rather boring, but it was predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points. But when he took the lead, he knew delightful long cuts, up mountains and through rocky places at breakneck speeds. It was all I could do to hang on, even though it looked like madness. He said, pedal, pedal. I worried. I was anxious. And I asked, where are you taking me? And he laughed and didn't answer. And I started to learn to trust. I forgot my boring life and entered into his adventure. And when I said, I'm scared, he leaned back and touched my hand. He took me to people with gifts that I needed, gifts of healing and acceptance and joy. And they gave me gifts to take on my journey, my Lord's and mine, and we were off again. And he'd say, now give those gifts away now. They're extra baggage, too much weight. So I did to the people we met. And I found that in giving, I received. And still, our burden was light. Now, I didn't trust him at first, in control of my life. I thought he'd wreck it. But he knows bike secrets. He knows how to make it bend and take sharp corners. He knows how to jump and clear high rocks. He even knows how to fly the short and the scary passages. And I'm learning to shut up and pedal in the strangest places. And I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze on my face and my delightful companion, Jesus. And he just smiles, even when I'm sure I can't do any more. And he says, pedal, pedal. Let's pray together. Father God, this banquet that you invite us to isn't just eternity. It is here and it is now. Lord God, your banquet represents the promised land for each one of us. It is that sweet spot for our life that is your promised land and it is specific to each one of us individually. Oh, Father God, I pray that you would help us to be people who choose to be not just a believer, but to be a disciple, to want to draw closer to Jesus because that's where the banquet is. That's where that promised land is, Lord. And we just ask this uh, in the name of your Son, your only Son. Amen.